Amen. Well, we've only got a couple more weeks in the book of Philippians. And so I'm, I'm grateful that we've had uh, what we're going to have spent now is about 12 weeks together studying the book of Philippians. And so uh, I've enjoyed it. I hope you have. Today we're in the last chapter, chapter 4. Um, so we're going to start in verse 2. And if you, uh, if you have a paper copy of your Bible, flip over there. Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. Um, if you're not familiar with the Bible, you can always Google that. Uh, Philippians 4, 2. And as we start in verse 2, we're reminded that our God, our God is a God of peace. He created it, peace. He ordains it. He gives it. He sustains it. Our focus passage today reminds us that our God is the God of peace and that he wants to give us his peace. Could you use a little bit of peace in your life? I mean, is that, can we all head nod to a little more peace would be a little bit better, right? We can all find places where peace would be good in our lives. So let's get into the text. Remember the, the Philippians is a book of the Bible, which is a letter from Paul to the church in the city of Philippi. And just, I don't know that we've ever discussed this as we've gone through this book together, but Philippi is a city in what is Greece. Uh, it's not on the map today. Um, its ruins are in a city that has a similar name, but it's in Greece beneath Bulgaria. So I don't know how good you are with your geography, but if you're great with it, you'll know where that is. If you're like most people, that means nothing. So let's just get into the text. Verse 2. Uh, and in verse 2, we'll see uh, that God, the God of peace, wants for this church and for us to agree. He wants for us to agree. So verse 2, the writer says, I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat, and I'm just going to pause. I, I YouTube like 50 different videos on how to say this person's name. Uh, and I'm, I'm just going to take one of the options. I mean, there, there was like every way you could imagine saying this was, was put out there as an option in, in websites and all the different places I could find it. So I'm, I'm going to work with uh, Sintachi to agree in the Lord. I've practiced that word. I can't tell you how many times this week. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Sintachi to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So here in chapter 4, we, we really get our first correction to the Philippian church. So far, this letter has been really encouraging. I mean, it's, it's kind of been, come on guys, keep working, let's keep doing this. And then here we get a correction. Uh, it, it's, it's even in this correction couched really uplifting it's in a really a hopeful tone but it's still calling for something that is wrong to change to something that is right Euodia and Sintichi are two women who are a part of this church body and apparently they've been having problems some relationship problem we have no idea what their dispute or disagreement is but we know they're not getting along Um, and whatever it is whatever the problem is it's gotten heated enough and it's lasted long enough that it's made it to the attention of Paul, who lives in another city. Right? He's kind of the mentor for this church, and he's heard about it. And he's heard about it in such a way that he thinks that he needs to deal with it. He needs to talk about it. So it's, been, it's a pretty tough topic, whatever it is. And you can almost imagine Paul checking in with one of the elders of the church or one of the elders of the church sending a letter to Paul and saying, hey, everything's going good. I mean, we've got some struggles. People are being persecuted. Uh, we're, we're really, I'm proud of the people, but uh, you remember Euodia and Sintichi? I mean, you remember them, Paul? Because Paul's been there. He knows these people. They're, they're really struggling to get along and it's, it's impacting the whole congregation. They're making people feel like they need to choose sides. It's taking the church's eyes off of ministry. Like you can imagine maybe some of these phrases being used to tell Paul about what's going on. And some people would call this drama, right? I mean, that's that's a popular cultural phrase for what we might see happening here between these two women. And unless you're William Shakespeare, drama does not honor God. I, I truly believe that part of our job as Christians is to squash drama from whatever angle we can. One of the themes of Philippians is that we get to be 
joy completers as followers of Christ, right? We've talked about that kind of phrase several times. We need to be joy completers. But one of the best ways that we can be a joy completer is by being a drama squasher. At Provision Church, we're, we're just not about provision. We're not about drama. We don't have time for non-essential squabbles. We've got too much ministry to do, too much life to live. We have too great a gospel to proclaim to be wasting time in frivolous drama. And that's true for every church, by the way. Any group, body of believers who claims Christ, that is true for. Whether that is a group of four or a group of 400, there is no time for that in the life of the Christian because the gospel is too great. Our call from the Lord is so large that we can't get distracted by small things. So how can we do what Philippians 2 calls us to and be like stars in the sky in a crooked and wicked generation, right? We're called to be like stars in the sky. How can we be like that when we're grumbling and arguing with other so-called stars? The majestic beauty of a million stars in the sky would be ruined if we thought that those glimmering lights at night were arguing with each other, right? We'd be like, they're pretty, but they're petty, right? It would lose some of the sheen and glimmer, the beauty. And shouldn't the same be true for the way non-Christians see Christians? I mean, we're claiming this glorious gospel. We're claiming this true salvation. And then we get caught up in these petty arguments, these problems that take away from what we say is true, We serve the God that created the universe and holds all things together and and still loves each of us intimately, intimately enough to know each hair on your head. We serve that God. But my friend Jeff is so annoying. Right? Isn't there a disconnect? Like, doesn't that seem weird? Isn't, Isn't that unreasonable almost? It doesn't make sense. The wise king of Israel, King Solomon, he he said as much. Proverbs 19, verse 11 says, Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. We need to hear that. (laughs) We need to hear that. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. How many friendships would be stronger because of that? How many marriages would be stronger because of that? How many churches would be stronger because of that? That we would be slow to take offense and overlooking offense even. So Paul is encouraging everyone there, everyone in Philippi, to remember their goal and the way that they've spent time working. He says, look, you, you guys, along with my true companion, uh, help these women who have labored side by side with me. But not only them, but Clement and the rest of the fellow workers. Look, we've been doing the right thing. So Paul's saying, remember the right thing. Get back to the gospel. These two women aren't lazy believers. right? The history for these two women doesn't seem to make sense that they're just disruptors in the church. They seem to be servant leaders in the church, doing the work of ministry. They're not delinquents. They labored with Paul and the other Christians for the sake of the gospel. And God wants them to be focused on that way more important thing than whatever they're arguing over. He wants them to agree. He says, agree in the Lord. Because we can be honest. I mean, as, we're, as we're talking through this, as we're thinking through this, sometimes the hurt that creates dispute isn't silly. Right? Sometimes we wouldn't fit the hurt that causes us to be in a dispute to fit into like a, a silly middle school feeling drama. Middle schoolers, no disrespect. Right? That sometimes the hurt is very serious. And so it takes feeling real pain in that dispute. Sometimes it takes deep humility and self-sacrifice to forgive and overlook offenses. Sometimes it's not just, I just need to grow up. Sometimes it's, man, I, I, I've just got to accept that hurt. I've got to accept that humility to overlook that offense. Even when forgiveness is given, it's difficult to get past the brutal awkwardness of broken trust and respect. Right? Don't you have those relationships where that, that relationship has been broken and now it's like, I don't see you in the same row at Target, right? 
we understand those relationships. And so it's, it's not easy. So if you know this and you've been here or, or are currently here and you can't find anything else to have in common, agree in the Lord. Right? And this is written to believers. Right? This, this, this is a different type of conversation from a believer to a non-believer. But in the church, two believers agree in the Lord. The best way to restore a destroyed relationship is to get grounded in the gospel. Then your attitude and position in the dispute doesn't really depend on the other person's attitude and position in it. When we ground a relationship in the gospel, we take away the personal grievances and look to Christ. Christ has great reason for offense against you and me. Every one of us in here, we have offended and hurt Christ more deeply than any other human being could hurt or offend us. We've done that with our sin. And yet, Jesus, our example, healed us by his wounds and bore our sins in his body on the tree. Instead of weaponizing our sins towards him, he died for us regardless of our response to that radical forgiveness. So, center your destroyed relationship around the shared experience of received grace and agree in the Lord. Agree to ground your relationship in the gospel, to love each other through sins that might have been committed against each other. What gossip, what breach of trust What pain did Jesus not also take on himself on that cross? So agree in the Lord. And from this position, we must be humbled. When we recognize the offense that Jesus took for us on the cross, how do we not humble ourselves beneath that and consider the ways that we've held ourselves above others and demanded a response to our forgiveness. Don't you feel a little smaller for the grudges you've held when you compare them to Jesus' forgiveness? I do. I think about those grudges and I, I pale in comparison to the Jesus' gracefulness to us. But, but that humbled position doesn't end in guilt. That's, that's an important thing to hear. Is that as we consider that Jesus is way more merciful and forgiving and gracious than we can ever be. We don't end in a slump of guilt. We we move to joy. Our our position of humility ends in joy. Our position as recipients of God's grace teaches us the goodness of God towards us. And we get to celebrate that. Paul does. Paul celebrates it. We're going to see that in these next few verses. So he calls for the church to agree. He calls for these two women to agree. And, and those two women, it could have been men, right? I mean, for, for all that we care, in our church, in our application, it's any relationship that applies to. Man, agree in the Lord. And so we see that call to agree. But then the next few verses points us, we see that the God of peace wants us to rejoice. Verse 4, look at, look at verse 4 with me. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I used to tell students when I taught high school that if I said something twice, that meant it was important, right? Y'all probably heard that from teachers or professors. It's just a rhetorical device. We, we all do it. I mean, we can hear the sound of our mothers saying, stop it, right? Can you, can you think back to your mom saying, stop it? And then when you didn't, her saying, stop it. And then like the escalating loudness of her voice and the scariness of her voice. I mean, that second time, you understand the importance. God's word says rejoice, And then louder, more forcefully, rejoice. Stop living a life of bickering and drama and start living a life of joy. It's like Euodia, Syntyche, this is important. First Peter teaches us that our belief in Christ should be followed by rejoicing with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. This is a reasonable order of things for a Christian. 
Our belief should be followed by joy. That's the only reasonable outcome of our faith. If we truly believe that the correct, check this out, here's the gospel, right? If we truly believe that the correct and just punishment for our sin is eternal death, eternal separation from Christ. If we truly believe that we could never save ourselves from that punishment, from that just punishment. If we believe that Jesus Christ was the only one who could. And if we believe that Jesus did, that he lived a perfect life, that he died the death we deserved, that he rose again to break sin's curse, and that now, instead of eternal punishment, we have eternal life. What can we do but rejoice? Isn't that, doesn't that make sense in your mind? Doesn't the gospel build you to joy when you think through it? If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian or you're hearing about this reason for joy for the first time, I want to ask you to give your life to Jesus. I'm just going to say that that clearly. Give your life to Jesus. Believe Jesus died for your sins and rose again and give him control of your life. And you can be saved. You can have this logical reason for joy. But verse 5 says, let your reasonableness, or some translations uh, translate that Greek to gentleness. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. And enjoy the follower of Christ gets to be gentle. We don't have to be harsh and prideful. We get to be gentle. Unlike Euodia and Syntyche, whose bickering was known to everyone. That's not the way of Christ. His way is to turn the other cheek, to walk the extra mile, to give the jacket, right? Our attitude is gentleness to each other. If further on in verse 5, the Lord is at hand and enjoy the follower of Christ recognizes his presence. The Lord is at hand. He is accessible to us. He tore the veil. He left us the Holy Spirit. The Lord is at hand. It's joy for us to have access to the sovereign God. The God who is in complete control is also completely with us. We get verse 6. Because he's sovereign, do not be anxious about anything. Enjoy. The follower of Christ doesn't worry about things beyond our control. A couple of weeks ago, I'll give a correction here. A couple of weeks ago, we read Philippians 2.28, where Paul talked about being glad to send Epaphroditus so that he'd be less anxious. And we said there are two different types of anxieties, right? And we're still going to see that here. But uh, in chapter 2, I said that the word there for anxiety was the same one in chapter 4. Uh, I had a conversation. I'm thankful for Jim Corth. If you're here and if you're listening and you're, hey, I want you being, thinking through this whatever I say. <laughs> I want you to compare it to scripture. And Jim did and was like, hey, I actually look back at, those are two separate words. And that was my own research failed me there. Um, so there, they are two different words that translate to anxiety, which even maybe more supports that point, that there are different types of anxieties. And so here in chapter four, we see the anxiety is, is about being distracted by cares. Chapter two is more about concern for fellow believers, where like, that's, that's healthy concern. It's good to feel concerned for God's cause. But here in chapter four, he's, we're seeing a call to not be distracted by the cares of this world, like Euodia and Syntyche. Their care was their dispute with each other. So Paul is saying, don't be distracted by these temporary problems. Instead, turn your attention back to Christ. Back to the God of peace. Because isn't anxiety really, think about this, anxiety is oftentimes the exact opposite of peace. Isn't it, doesn't anxiety play out as a battle in our minds so often? A battle is a war waging in our, in our, in our lives. And we let anxiety reign over our lives, over our thoughts, instead of peace. Isn't it time we trade the anxiety in our lives for peace. That's exactly the trade that God offers. <laughs> Praise God. Like we're not stuck in a pattern of, of anxiety. And I know there's, there's anxiety disorders and, and we can talk more deeply about those things. But just on the surface, for those of us who are letting our minds go to anxiety instead of giving it to the peace of God, God is offering that peace. 
He tells you to give him your burdens and he'll give you rest. He says, come to him all who are weary and he'll give you rest. He gives peace. Verse 6 continues, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Enjoy the follower of Christ goes to our Father for help. We, we have the joy of going to our Father with our needs. There's a real connection between prayer and joy and peace. If you're lacking joy or peace, I bet you're lacking prayer. There, there's, there's a real, and not always, right? But, but generally, there's that real connection between joy and peace and prayer. If you lack peace and you feel full of worry, the, the remedy, the medicine for that is prayer. You give it to Jesus. And, and as I was working through this and reading back over this, it reminded me of a hymn, just thinking through this. And um, it, it's, a, it's a hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Do y'all, y'all know that song? Can I do something weird? Are y'all cool with this? What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Is that too weird? Do you want to do verse 2? I kind of like it. You want to do verse 2? Let's do verse 2. Every trials and temptations is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Very nice. Hey, y'all sound good. I love it. I think God gives us music to reflect and encourage us towards biblical truths, right? I mean, so we have a friend in Jesus who wants us to share those sorrows, who wants us to never be discouraged, who wants us not to fall to temptations, who wants us not to bear needless pain or forfeit his peace, right? This is so true for this passage here, that God has given us his peace in Jesus Christ, let's, let's stop giving it up. Let's turn to him. And verse 7 says, The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God surpasses all understanding. Some of you have experienced this. right? Some, I, I, some of you haven't. Some, some of you have not needed a time for peace that passes all understanding. But I, I bet looking around this room that there are those of you in here who there's been a time where you've needed it and God's given that peace where I don't know why I feel peace right now, but God's given it. And it's, it's I can't understand it. It surpasses understanding that deep, abiding, real, true peace. The God of peace gives it to his children abundantly. Aren't you thankful to serve a God who gives that type of good gift to his children? If you've experienced it, you know, and and you're thinking in uh, in joy of of that peace that God gives. If you don't know, go ahead and lay claim to that promise that God gives peace to his children. Because there will be a time, and you will be glad for it, that God gives that peace. 
He takes our distractions and brings us closer to him. And prayer and rejoicing has a lot to do with that. If you, if you feel far from God, I want to challenge you to rejoice in him. If you feel like God's not near, find reasons to rejoice in, in God. Find reasons, not that you need one, they're, they're everywhere, to pray to him. Talk to against our flesh, against sin, this peace in Christ that comes from submitting and surrendering to him in prayer and submitting and surrendering to him in our attitude, it guards our hearts and minds from sin. And if you're caught in sin this morning, if you're struggling with sin, consider prayer and rejoicing as a better alternative to guilt. Right? Guilt corrects that's the responsibility and duty of guilt, right? It's to bring correction to our attention. But if we stay in guilt, then, then we're, we're then being disobedient to God in other ways. So don't stay in guilt. Let guilt correct, but put your eyes back on Christ. Let your, let your attention be given to what Jesus has done for us. Don't, don't live in guilt over sin. Live in prayer and rejoicing in the one who delivers from sin. That's practical help for us this morning. Live in rejoicing and prayer in the one who delivers from sin. Verse 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So here in verse, verse 8, we get this, really, a command to think. We, we as children of the God of peace are given the responsibility and the blessing to think. Euodia and Syntyche, their, their sisters, whether... whether for them or for brothers, Paul is saying, stop living a life of bickering and drama and start living a life of joy. Don't let your minds and your thoughts get dragged into the mud. Right? When, when our thoughts are held to lesser things, to sinful things, it's hard to be joyful because we're lost in the pit of the despair of sin. So keep your mind on the things of God. Don't drift into sinful and selfish thoughts. Think on these things. He gives us a helpful list. Think on these things. Look at that in in your copy of the Bible. Whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Me, these are the ty- type of things that we should saturate our minds in. I mean, right? I mean, you can imagine just pouring a bowl full of this and you get to let your cereal be soggy in this bowl. Your mind gets to get soggy in the bowl of these things. Just, just let it sit there. This is what our mind should be resting on and thinking on. God made us to think and consider. He gave us these crazy instruments in our heads, these brains to think and consider. He gave us incredible minds to think with. Paul's writing and saying, don't waste that mental capacity on garbage. Hey, for, for some of our middle schoolers and high schoolers, for some of our 20 and 30 year olds, for some of our 40 and 50 year olds, for some of our 60 and 70 year olds, I can keep going. Does this not ring true for us? Put your mind on the things of God. Put your mental capacity to work for the cause of Christ instead of for the cause of garbage. Even in the book of Job, a guy named Elihu called on Job and his friends to use their minds for the sake of thinking about God. It says in Job 37, 14, Hear this, O Job. Stop and consider the wondrous works of God. Stop and consider the wondrous works of God. I I think one of the, the worst stigmas, stereotypes that has been given to Christians, and maybe rightfully so, is that we're anti-intellectual, that we don't want to hear factual arguments, that we're against science. I mean, there's a lot of falsehoods out there 
about what Christians believe about science, but our God created science, right? Our God created knowledge. As we search for truth, we find attributes of God because our God is true. And so we should be people using our minds and, and encouraging and building up the, the use of knowledge and gaining knowledge because it helps us think about God. We should stop and consider the wondrous works of God. Here's the thing. You get to control your thoughts, church. It's a pretty cool thing about you is that you get to control your thoughts. So turn your thoughts to the wondrous works of God. Don't settle for running negative thoughts on repeat in your mind. I don't want to sound like, I don't want to sound like some positivity guru standing on stage being like, hey, be positive. It's this simple. Change your thoughts. Be positive. That's not what I'm doing. I'm reading scripture to you that says, consider the wondrous works of God. But don't settle for negative thoughts. Put your thoughts on the positive, wondrous works of God. If you're a negative person always filled with worry and anxiety, stop and consider the wondrous works of God. When you're filled with fear and feel paralyzed, stop and consider the wondrous works of God. When you feel overwhelmed, stop. Consider the wondrous works of God. When you feel tempted, stop. Consider the wondrous works of God. When someone spoils Avengers Endgame for you, stop. (laughs) Just stop. Some of us haven't seen it yet. so. So we're called to think on God, but that thinking must also turn to action, right? So, we, we get this opportunity to, to stop and consider God. And, I mean, take that time for meditation. I don't know how many of you have opportunities in your life where you're like, oh yeah, when I'm sitting there silently, I could think on what is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Like I could just sit there and think, this is just. Praise God, this is just, right? Uh, some of us never carve out times of solitude and meditation in our day. I say that's to the detriment of our walk with Christ. I mean, we need solitude and silence and meditation, and we need to be putting our minds on the things of God. That's important. God calls us to that, but it's not the only thing He calls us to. Right? If all we did was sit in like high temples and never talk to anybody or did anything and only thought on God, that would also be disobedient. Right? So there's, there's disobedience where all we do is think about God, but there's also disobedience where we never think about God. Yeah, okay, y'all catching that? Okay, we need to find that balance. And I would say in our American culture, the balance is never on the side of silence and solitude and thinking about God. So look for that in your life. Look for that balance in your life because it will bring you joy and, and gladness. It will bring you closeness to God. But in verse 9, we see that our thoughts must turn to action. Verse 9 says, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So here in verse 9, we see practice. So the God of peace has called us to agree in the Lord. He's called us to rejoice. He's called us to think, and he's called us to practice. I mean, these are all parts of finding peace in God. These are all parts of receiving that peace that God gives. These are all part of the Christian life. Check back in verse 6 and 7. You see in those verses a promise for peace from God if we pray. It's like, pray and and the God of peace will be with you. Verse 9 returns to promises of peace with practicing what God's words say. So, so we look at the promise for peace in prayer, but we also see that promise for peace in practicing what God's word says. Practice these things. Don't just think and consider, also do We have to be men and women of action, doers of the word, right? We know faith without works is dead. James teaches us that we deceive ourselves when we hear the word and we don't do anything with it. If all we do is hear it but don't do it, we're we're lying. Faithful followers of Christ practice biblical principles. This isn't a call for works-based religion. I'm, I'm not advocating earning salvation. That's not what I'm calling. I want to always be clear. 
We can't earn our salvation. Praise God. I am advocating being filled with the joy of Christ so fully that we live in the overflow of that joy. I feel like sometimes overflow is a hippie word in the Christian language, but it's a good word to think about. What is your joy like? I mean, is the, is the joy, is your cup overflowing with joy? Are you serving God out of that joy? That we act because it is a genuine desire for us because of our salvation. Are you ever considering the gospel in a way that drives you to love others and serve others and share with others? And like practicing a sport or a skill, practice comes with errors. Errors. We practice knowing we mess up, but that we keep going, right? I mean, this isn't a call for perfection. This isn't a call to get it right every time, but this is a, this is a call to do what God has called us to, to keep working at it, to not give up, to not get discouraged when you slip and fall, but to get up and continue practicing. Practice these things. Can we practice squashing drama? Can we practice rejoicing? Can we practice thinking on the things of God? I think we can. I think the gospel drives it to it, drives us to it. I think our love for each other drives us to that. Man, aren't you compelled by your love for each other? Let's, uh, let's finish this way. Band, y'all can come on up. I want to talk through our, our goals and action steps. So, so talking through this passage, I think there's a couple clear goals. There's more than a couple, and so I just picked out a couple just to keep it simple. Uh, squash drama. Everybody loves squash, and so we want to, um, I'll put a picture image in your head, right? Just think about taking that beautiful little yellow fruit, uh, vegetable, sorry, that was wrong. Little leg of it, and just think about squashing the, squashing the drama out of your life with it. I mean, just, you get it perfectly mashed up, ready to go in your skillet. We want to squash drama. And, and so we do that. The action steps for that are praying for protection from it. Sorry, that was... That was we want to pray for protection from drama, from the, the disputes in our lives, from serious or silly. Ask God to keep you away from it. And then the other thing is to overlook offenses. We, just, we have to be humble enough not to need retribution for every offense against us. And then the other goal we see is to live in peace, not anxiety. So our action steps for living in peace, not anxiety, would be to pray for God to work in your situation. Prayer is saying, God, I rely on you to do what I can't do. I rely on you to control the situation because I can't. And so when we pray for God to work in our situation, that's, a, that's, that's really expressing faith in what God can and does do. And then we also need to stop and consider the wondrous works of God. When, when anxiety enters your world, stop and consider. And sit down on a fallen tree sometime and stop and consider the wondrous works of God. That's a practical step for you and working through anxiety and fear in your life. God's got something that he wants for you. And that thing might be full of suffering, but I promise you it's also full of joy and peace and love and gentleness and goodness. It's full of Christ. Right? Don't we want Christ this morning? Like, can I get some head nods that we want Christ this morning? Okay, thank you. Let's pray together. Let's pray together for what God has done for us and that he would continue working. God, we thank you that you are better than life. God, we think about the believers in Sri Lanka who lost their lives a couple weeks ago now, or a week ago now, God. God, we thank you for their example. We pray for those that they left behind. But God, we ask that you prepare us to we would we be ready to lose our lives for you because you are better. God, the things that seem big to us now, God, unless they're about you, are small. Help us to live life with the correct perspective of eternity. I thank you for the sacrifice of your son. We love you so much. Pray it in your name. Amen.